Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, and follow God's word, we're gonna be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I gonna marry? What kind of life am I gonna live? How am I gonna raise my kids? What am I gonna do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Hey, welcome back to the choices we face. Last week, we heard a really clear and compelling and challenging talk from Father Mark Goring, a young priest from the new religious order called the Companions of the Cross. And incidentally, if you know any young men that are looking for a religious order, that's a darn good one. You can, you can find it online. And this week, we're gonna continue hearing from Father Mark uh, the rest of the, the seven things that he told us he was gonna get through last week that he didn't. Good, looking forward to it. I mean, it's it's talking about the bad news, right? He was talking about the reality of, of hell and the truth that's there. So he's breaking open the church's teaching about what it means. And as you say, we made it halfway through the list. Yeah, and yeah. you gotta know the bad news in order to appreciate the good news. So we're gonna really do both today. We're gonna look a little bit more at the bad news, but we're gonna really be grateful for the good news. The fourth point, each one of us has a mortal wound. It's like being thrown into a fight, say it's being thrown into a boxing match, but before you're thrown in, someone, someone gives you a little, a little stab in the side. And so you're, you're entering into the boxing match already weakened and incapacitated to a degree. We step into this battle already with a wound. It's like we've hit our heads. Has anyone hit their head really hard? You kind of lose, you lose, maybe lose your memory for a bit or, or kind of lose your orientation. That's what's happened to us. As children of God, we're made for goodness, we're made for life, we're made for love, and yet read the newspapers. Why do human beings do such horrific things? Why do our friends do such horrific things? Why do my neighbors do such horrific things? Why do the people I live with do such horrific things? Why do I do such horrific things, you know? We, we have a tendency to self-destruct. There's a woundedness. It's mysterious. It's mysterious, but it's real. We hear about this in John chapter 3, verse 19. The Lord Jesus says, This is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. It's a mysterious reality. We're wounded. We're disoriented. The fifth point, our relationship with God has been broken or it has been wounded. You see, we were made, we were made by God. We were made in his image and likeness. It's supposed to be completely, perfectly natural for us to look towards God. To, 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 to allow the radiance of his love, his face, to shine on us and for us to return that. That's, not, that's supposed to be natural. Just like a child. A child wants to be with her mother and look towards her and be held by her. A child doesn't want anything else. But what has happened with our relationship with God? It's like we're, we're a branch that has been broken and just barely hanging on to the tree. And the life that's supposed to come from the stem of the tree into the branch, it's not entering into the branch anymore. The branch is just hanging there, dying. And we've lost, because of the fall, we've lost our immortality. The light, that fire, that, that, that divine life has been lost. And that's why so many people, they'll say, I don't believe in God. They don't, they don't believe in the one who made them. The one who, who gives them life, the one who, who wants to dwell in them. That's why so many people are afraid of God. 
Maybe some of you are saying, yeah, I'm afraid of God. That's not normal. It's not normal for a child of God to be afraid of God, the one who made us. Especially since we know God is love. So many people are afraid of God. So many people, they don't trust God. And maybe again, some of us are saying, yeah, like, I, I, I'm not sure if I trust God. That's not normal. It's like we, you hear stories of someone, you know, they'll hit their head. A child hits her head. And when she comes back, the father's like, oh, my child, are you okay? And she's like, hey, get away from me. Who are you? And the father's like, I'm your dad. It's like, who, go ahead, get away. I'm afraid of you. I don't trust you. And I was like, that's what's happened to fallen humanity. We don't recognize the God who made us. We're afraid of him. We don't trust him. We're not even sure if we believe in him. The sixth point, this reality called sin. Sin has come and it's infected our souls. There's a dis-ease. Again, we all feel this within us. There's this brokenness, this wound. And every one of us knows this reality. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul says, All have sinned and are deprived of the glory of God. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 10, John tells us, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. We all know this mysterious reality of our tendency to do the things we know that aren't good for us. But why do we want to do them anyway? Why do we, why do we want to hurt people? Why do we want to do things that hurt ourselves? There's an infection in our souls. There's a stain upon our souls. It's called sin. Even private sin. We can do things privately that no one will ever know. It's just us. And that, those sins can take away the light inside of us. We say, well, I'm not hurting anyone. You're hurting yourself. And by losing your divine light, you're hurting others. And we know the gravity of this sin. Paul tells us that the wages of sin is death. It's so important for us to get this notion clear in our heads. Sin is not cool. It's not kind of, you know, hip. Now, some people, you know, they might want to be making fun, making, you know, uh, making fun of their a friend. You know, people, maybe at high school, there's a, there's a kid who's maybe not socially too strong or whatever. And so they, they make fun of him. They tease him. And they think, oh, that's fun. It's cool. It's cool to make fun of someone. There's nothing cool about that. You're hurting someone. It's not cool. Get that idea out of your head. There's nothing cool about sin. Sin is wicked. It's cruel. It's hurtful. It does damage. What does it do? It destroys innocence. And every one of us probably can relate to this. There's things that have been done to us, that were done to us when we were young children that's, that's, that's wounded us, that we wish would have never happened to us. That's what sin does. It wounds. It wounds. It takes away our innocence, destroys it in some cases. Sin hurts children. You know, parents who are yelling and arguing at each other. That hurts their kids. It hurts people. Sin breaks. Sin can break a mother's heart. Think of a mother who has a child, and the child is just starting school. And again, maybe the child struggles with stuff. The child, again, might not be as, you know, as socially as strong as others. And she sends her child to, to begin school, and the child comes home in tears because he was bullied. Think about what that does to a mother's heart, to see her child hurt, bullied, in tears. That's what sin does. It's not cool. There's nothing beautiful about sin. Sin shatters people's dreams. You think of the person who works maybe many years trying to make enough money, I don't know what, to, to buy a little house of his own for his family. And someone comes and steals from him. And all that, those years of hard work is lost because someone stole. Sin shatters dreams. Sin can kill a person's spirit. You know, we've all been victims of gossip. Some people start saying stuff about us. You're like, wait a minute, that's not true. That's not at all true. And it, it crushes our spirit. That's what sin does. Sin takes away our ability to fly. 
As children of God, we're made, to, we're made for wonderful things. You think of the person who's, who's a slave uh, uh, of, of an addiction, someone who's addicted to something. Some people have had addictions that they've been enslaved to for decades. And you think how much this, this, this addiction has, has just incapacitated the person, the things the person could have done, the places they could have traveled, the good they could have done, the, the life they could have brought to people, but instead they were addicted to this drug or to this bottle. And the, the, the damage it's done, that's what sin does. There's nothing cute about sin. There's nothing, some people say, oh, I'm just human. Being sinful is not just being human, it's being inhuman. And that's what we need to get clear in our minds. God didn't make us to, be, to, to sin. He made us to be holy, to be virtuous, to be pure, to be good, to love. And yet, in some mysterious way, we still kind of like sin. Like the Lord Jesus said, they preferred darkness to light. The scripture says we have hard hearts. We, there's a hardness in our hearts. And the worst among the sinners is perhaps those who don't even recognize that they're sinners. Jesus speaks about that. He says, if the eye in you is bad, how, how, how dark will your darkness be? The people who say, I'm not doing anything wrong. Some of the worst people doing the worst things would, would say, I'm not doing anything wrong. And that's the, the most horrific uh, of sinners is those who, who, who don't even recognize that what they're doing is wrong. The seventh and last point, we can't get out of this condition on our own. We, we can't, I can't fix the problem. You know, it's not a question of going to see a doctor. Doctors are great. They can help us with, with, with physical ail ailments and things like that, but they can't deal with this wounded spirit, this mortal wound. They can't help us with that. A psychiatrist, some people, they spend their whole lives, lives going to psychiatrists, psychiatrists, psychologists. They're needed. They're good. They can help us. But if there is a spiritual wound, you need a divine physician. A psychologist can't help you without the grace of God. There's no self-help book that's going to give you three easy steps to fixing the mortal wound on your soul. There's no kind of just willpower, you know, just get a grip, you know, this year for 2019, you know, I'm not going to have this brokenness anymore. It's, you can't just will it away. There's no program of life. There's no meditation techniques that can make this go away. And brothers and sisters, that's why you're here. You're here because you understand you need, we need a divine physician. We need our creator, our God, to help us. We need to cry out to him. But what must happen is there must be a firm decision to close the door of sin in our life. We need to recognize the sin, we need to name it, we need to renounce it, and we need to rebuke it. We can't have a compromise with sin in our life. Yes, we all struggle with weakness. We're gonna struggle with weakness our whole life. I'm not saying that, I'm not promoting a kind of a perfectionism that you don't ever, you know, you don't ever have a second cookie when you should really only have one. That's not what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about a fundamental, decision that I will live in the light. I will not play around with sin. If something is wrong, I will fight it. I will, I will, with the grace of God, fight this. I renounce sin. I rebuke sin. I do not want sin in my life. This talk is inviting people to make that firm and definitive decision. So brothers and sisters, what I want to do with you is I want to take you through the renewal of baptismal promises that we do at the Easter Vigil. Now you're here, you made a sacrifice of being here today, I would imagine because you want more of God in your life. So I, 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 I'm imagining that you do want to renounce sin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you some questions 
and then I'm going to say a little prayer. And again, this is from the Easter Vigil Renewal of Baptismal Promises. Dear brothers and sisters, through the Paschal Mystery, we have been buried with Christ in baptism, so that we may walk with Him in newness of life. Let us renew the promises of, of holy baptism, by which we once renounced Satan and his works, and promised to serve God in the Holy Catholic Church. And so I ask you, so I'm looking for some answers here, and answer strongly, what we speak has power. Do you renounce Satan and all his works and all his empty show? Do you renounce sin so as to live in the freedom of the children of God? Do you renounce the lure of evil so that sin may have no mastery over you? Do you renounce Satan, the author and prince of sin? Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? Creator of heaven and earth. Do. do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered death and was buried, rose again from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father? Do. do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and bestowed on us forgiveness of our sins, keep us by His grace. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for eternal life. Amen. Well, you know what? We need more priests preaching like Father Mark, telling the truth, speaking clearly, just, just speaking the Word of God. I've, I've written a book called Priest as Prophet, Priestly Participation in the Prophetic Ministry of Jesus. And give this to your priests. Encourage them and to be bold in their preaching, to tell people the truth. You can get it at our website, renewalministries.net. Peter, it's so good to hear other people saying it like it is. Yeah, it's crucial. Yeah. And I think there's a, an important lesson I, you see in Father Mark. He's just delivering the mail without editing the mail. He's, yes. he's, he's bringing the message of Jesus and the saints and the teaching of the church. And notice he's talking about a very difficult subject, uh, but he's not condemning anyone. He's not thundering in anger or something. He's just saying, let's listen to the teaching of Jesus. What does Jesus have to say to us? Because we know and we trust he's love itself. He's the, tr he's the truth about everything. He knows us. He knows our condition. And he's come to save us. What does he want us to know? The question is, what does he want us to know? Not what do we want to know? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, what do yeah. I think my people want to know? Right right? right? right, right. But we want to communicate that. And so it's doable. It's very doable. That was, that was you know, challenging, but it wasn't something that would discourage people at all. Yeah. It's just seeing the truth. It's amazing. And the Holy Spirit, when you speak the truth, the Holy Spirit moves and confirms the word that's preached, and then the power of God's word begins to change our lives. Yeah, I'd say 50 years ago, you'd hardly have to preach that because everybody believed it, everybody knew it. You know, yeah. there was clarity in, in, that, in the teaching that was being transmitted, you know? And nowadays it's sort of like, whoa, wow, where did that come from? I had never heard that before, you know? And unfortunately, there's been a big intimidation of, of priests and lots of people, you know, so they don't, they don't feel courageous enough to say that? Yeah, no. I mean, this is just one area that the world doesn't like us to talk about anymore. Right. So we acquire but there's sexual immorality. There's a whole set of things yeah. that are the clear teaching of Jesus that make us a distinct people. Yeah. That, that it's a different way of life. It's kingdom life. Yeah. And we're afraid to talk about it because the world's saying, you better not talk about it because you're yeah. gonna, you're, we're going to push back on you or we'll cancel you or we'll do something yeah. that's going to make life hard for you. Yeah. And I think sometimes for priests on, on a Sunday, I mean, and somewhat sympathetic to that initial awareness that they have, that to say, if I talk about some of this, I know that there's some of my parishioners out there aren't buying this anymore. Yeah. And it's going to be very difficult. They're going to be upset. And I hardly ever get to see them anyway. So they're only here a couple times a month or whatever it might be. I don't want to chase them out the door. That's not a good way to look at it. No, yeah. no. The more we delay in speaking about 
the things that our culture has intimidated us to be quiet about, the more we delay, the worse it's going to get. The, the greater number of our people are going to be captured by the world. More and more people are going to be just filled with the spirit of, of the age rather than the spirit of God. So we can't delay. But that also means that we have to kind of prepare for feedback, pushback, uh, division. I know one of the things, you know, that priests are taught is you got to keep the peace. You got to make, you know, you're the priest of all the people, you know, you just got to not offend people. Bishop doesn't want anything kind of, kind of coming out in the newspapers, you know, so just be safe, you know, be careful. And unfortunately that approach has led to our people being captured by the world. Right. So we have to be prepared for some division because there already is a division. We're pretending that there's a unity, but there isn't. There already is a division, and we have to give everybody a chance. We have to give the people who are rightly disposed to the Lord and his message a chance to be strengthened, but we also have to give the people a chance who have been captured by the world to repent and to come back. I was thinking about uh, the book of Revelation. Where is it? I think it's chapter 12, maybe where uh, the martyrs, you know, who are yeah. they're, they're They're being celebrated in heaven. It's important for us to keep friends in eternal perspective. Mm -hmm. What gets honored and celebrated in heaven? You know, the martyrs who died, they were witnesses, right? They, they conquered this darkness of the devil through the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And what that means is, you know, the word their witness is martyr. And we are living through a time that's very challenging. And as a result, we, we may want to, you know, what should I say, emphasize some things less, but that's a mistake. This is a moment of great opportunity for us because to be a believer in Jesus, to be a follower is just to witness to the truth. Yeah. And if we get, I mean, Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, if men revile you, if they accuse yeah. you, yeah. if they make life hard for you on account of me, Jesus' response is rejoice, jump for joy, he says in Luke's yeah, gospel. That's so counterintuitive, counter yeah. but that's, that's a blessing to receive it. Yeah. That and means that's, you're being faithful, you're being a faithful right, witness. Right. If you're a faithful witness, there's going to be some opposition. Yeah, and Jesus encourages us with that to say, yeah. don't worry if they come after you. Remember they came after me, and look where I am. I'm ruling the heavens and the earth. I'm reigning in glory, and everybody who walks in my footsteps is going to share in the glory that belongs to me. And that's that witness of the martyrs. You yeah, know, they're being yeah. honored, and the angels rejoice, and they're honored in the kingdom of heaven because they just stood the ground. They endured. They persevered yeah. in the witness to the truth of what Jesus revealed. Yeah. Last week, Father Mark was emphasizing the reality of Satan, the reality of hell. This week he was emphasizing the reality of how awful sin is, and sin is not normal. Sin's normal to our fallen condition, but it, the Lord wants to rescue us from that, you know? And Father Mark was particularly pointing out the importance to make a clear decision, to identify sin as sin, not kind of fudge it over and say, well, this is just, this is just, you know, unexp you know, whatever, you know, but just to say, hey, that's wrong. I got to face it. I got to admit it. That's wrong. I got to ask the Lord for help and really overcoming. I got to turn away from that. I've got to do the things I need to do to get free. I got to stop going to certain websites. I got to stop drinking too much. I got to stop hanging around with certain people. I got to do what I need to do in order to get free of sin because sin can kill us. Like, like Father Mark said, sin can kill you and give yeah. you eternal death. Yeah. And I think grasping the reality of that's so important and being able to see, you know, both sides, you might say of it to say the reality, the consequences of sin. I mean, it's easy to delude ourselves and when we're trapped in it, when we are afraid to let it go, we're yeah. so attached to it. So that delusion happens and, and the fear of God, the reality of hell and the consequences is really important to hear that. And, and mm. holding that back from people is very unwise and it's not a loving thing to do. But also what we need to hear is the mercy and the love of God for yeah. God so loved the world yeah. that he gave his only son. I was thinking of, you know, how John's letters too are so filled with these wonderful insights. So John says this in, uh, First letter of John, chapter four, verse nine. In this is in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through Him. And in this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the expiation of our sins. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's really beautiful. I mean, isn't that the, that's the good news, John? Yeah. Is the apostles, their their minds, their imagination, their souls, their hearts were just so lifted by this. Beloved, we're God's children now. Look what he's done for us. He came to take away sin. So give it to him. Don't fight it. Give it to him. Surrender. And then receive his love, which is what your heart's longing for anyway. Yeah. Peter, you know, Father Mark went through the baptismal promises again. Why don't you just pray from your heart for people today who are struggling with sin? Yeah. The Lord, give them the grace to make a yes. decision and break free. Yes, yes. And I just want to say, first of all, brothers and sisters, the Lord has great compassion on you. He doesn't condemn you. Satan wants to condemn you. So you back away, you give up, you go away. We want to pray right now that your heart could really be entrusted into the hands of the living God. Father in heaven, we just heard the amazing words from John of the gift that you've given to each one of us in your beloved son. Love brought him, love brought him to the cross. And on that cross, he took away sins. Today, brothers and sisters, receive the love of Jesus. Offer to him, give to him right now, whatever sins, whatever secret sins are in your life. Trust him, ask him to forgive you. Go to confession when the opportunity comes. He wants to heal you and free you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You know, that passage you read from 1 John, it says, and this is love, not that we love God, but he loved us. The Lord takes the initiative in reaching out to us, and he's, he's, he's doing that today. He's doing that by you watching this program or listening to this program. He's doing by by what Father Mark said. You know, he can also do it by this booklet that Peter's written. It's called Fear God and Give Him Glory. The Lord is reaching out to you. He's taking initiative. He wants you to be safe with him more than you want that for yourselves. So take this as an opportunity. Take this as a moment of grace and make the decisions you need to make. We'd be happy to send you this booklet at no cost just for the asking. Go to our website, renewalministries.net. Call the 800 number and we'll get this booklet right out to you. You need to do everything you can to strengthen yourself in the battle that we're in that we just heard so wonderfully about. One of the most overlooked yet foundational spiritual gifts is the fear of the Lord. The scriptures call this gift a fountain of life, a source of confidence in the beginning of wisdom. Today our culture, politics, and even the church are in crisis. Everyone can see the deep division, the escalation of anger and violence, and whole nations seem to be in the grip of fear. We have come to fear the wrong things, the opinions of men, and losing our idols. The fear of God is not in the land, and God in his mercy is shaking the nations to wake us up so we hear his word. Do not fear what this people fear. Rather, fear God and give him glory. In this booklet, I explain the fear of the Lord, why it is an antidote to the current crisis, and how you can awaken this gift in your life. To receive a free copy, visit our website or call the number on the screen.